All right, we're live. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to another incredible Visibility Era podcast. I'm here today with Lydia Bagarosa, and behind the scenes is also Jess Bubico, who we're going to be interviewing today. It's going to be such a cool conversation. She has done an amazing job getting her children's book onto TV. She's been pitching herself, and she knows a thing or two about Jane Keys and human design. So we're, we're going to have a good conversation today. Um, a couple of just announcements if you're here in the community or if you're listening to this podcast podcast episode. This is the last call for Visibility on Purpose. The program begins on Wednesday and we cannot wait to have you with us. We're going to be talking all about media strategy, media outreach, how to get your brand featured on those big publications or in those magazines or on those podcasts that you know that you're meant to share that message in front of. So join us inside Visibility on Purpose. We cannot wait to see you inside and Yay. welcome to the show today. Welcome, Jess. So I will give a little quick introduction, and then I'm also going to let her introduce herself a little bit more, but she sent me the most beautiful bio. So Jess Fabico is a friend of mine, but I also personally know her as an author, a speaker, a guide. She supports entrepreneurs in healing, wellness, and creative spaces to really wake up who they are by discovering their unique blueprint. So she is an expert in human design and the gene keys. She offers deeper understandings into who you are, so you can create the business that your heart really desires versus trying to create what is going on in your head, which I know we can all relate to. Um, something that we're really going to focus on today, in, in addition to all these amazing things like human design and gene keys, is she created this beautiful book, Jesse Lou and the Magic of You. She wrote it. Um, so I can't wait to talk about this. It's, I honestly, I literally, I literally cried. <laughs> She's showing it to me. I started reading it and tears streamed down my face. Um, so this is definitely the most beautiful book I've ever written for kids, but we're going to talk about this today. And also the fact that she's basically given herself her own TV tour, which has blown my mind. So we're going to talk about TV exposure, how she's presented herself and maybe some tips and tips and tricks. If you're somebody that wants to get on TV, but maybe you don't know how to introduce yourself or what to do when you actually get on the stage. Cause you know, we can get nervous. So Jess, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to dive into all of this today. Me too. So I would love to start out with hearing a little bit about your business journey, and then we can kind of pivot into the book and how that, how you transition into this, because you have so many amazing things that you are an expert in. So I'd love to hear all the pieces and how they came together. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so I started out in speech therapy. That was my very first career, which was a big part of why I wrote this children's book because I worked with children and, um, adults, but primarily children during my career. And, um, a lot of kids, I remember when I graduated from graduate school and I went out into the world doing my speech therapy thing. And I was like, there's so many emotions and so many behavioral challenges and challenges that, you know, they make it seem like in grad school, we did our clinical practicum too, which was amazing. But you kind of think in grad school, you're like, okay, you learn the thing, you take it from the book and you go out into the world and you do it. And it's just translates from textbook learning classes into how things are in the real world. And again, thankfully we had practicums and things like that and mentorship. So, you know, you had a little bit of real world experience, but one of the big things I learned was just how much more there is to a human being in general, there'd be a speech challenge, a speech, you know, a problem that was going on. And then you realized when you started to work with the kid, like, okay, there's family dynamics. Okay. There's issues with food and, um, you know, are they sleeping well? And there's so much more that goes into what the surface level problem seems like. Mm -hmm. And so I started to realize as I was gaining more experience in the field that like, I needed more education. And at the same time, I started to have my own spiritual awakening of sorts. And I was kind of like, there's more to this life than just what we're seeing in this 3D. And I need more tools to help kids with big emotions, to understand family dynamics. I need more counseling. I was doing a lot more behavioral work and helping kids again, work through big emotions or behavioral challenges. Okay. Well, why are they having those problems? Uh, you know, what's going on with their family of origin? And so I started pursuing 
you know, learning about nutrition in a deeper way, understanding and learning about, you know, family trauma. And that led me to start my own business. And so I actually started a business. It was more in the spiritual world and the spiritual realm, working with intuition and energy and Reiki and really starting to follow that path. And then along the way, I started to gather all, I mean, like I've taken every class it feels like ever, which I'm sure most people who are listening to this podcast can relate to. You just start picking up skills and different things like that. And so that led me into understanding, wanting to understand like personalities. So I started to look into like disc and things like that. And then human design and the gene keys came into my life. And honestly, it's kind of just been, I feel like my journey has been like one step leading into the next. And in 2020, I was going through an emotional time where I, I had some like big stuff happen in my business. And what I didn't realize was that I was very good at like going out and achieving and creating a business and making my business work and growing it and all this stuff. But I had all of, and, and understanding emotion, like I understood emotion, but I didn't know how to feel my emotions. Mm -hmm. So there's a very big difference, I think, between thinking your emotions and feeling your emotions. And so I, I went to lunch this one day cause I was just struggling. And I, I think sometimes some of the messaging that I had internalized from the personal development world was like, if you have feelings, then you're like weak in a certain way. I don't know that that's what people were saying, but that's how I internalized it. Like you have to manifest and if you're in a bad mood, you're going to manifest bad stuff. If you're in a good mood, you're going to manifest good stuff. So yeah. I wasn't letting myself process. And so I went to lunch and I was like, I'm just going to write. And I wrote out popped this children's book about feeling your big emotions really for my own inner child was where it came from. Um, and so like the journey again, that like life journey just took me to 2020, my family, I had shared it with them. They're like, publish the book. I was like, I don't know. It's not right time. Like it just didn't feel right. And then finally last year, a girlfriend of mine was publishing a book and I'm like, now's my time. I'm just going to start seeking it out. And you know, all the right people showed up to start putting the book out there and, or to start the process of publishing the book. Yeah. Gosh. So I, yeah. I feel like I'm like everything. It's like, when you look at it from that bird's eye view perspective, it's like everything in my life has led to the next step. And then as, as it does for all of us, if we just follow those breadcrumbs of where life is taking us. Yeah. That was such a beautiful roadmap that you just provided. Cause I'm like, okay, all these pieces had to add up. And when you were talking about, um, children having these like underlying issues, my sister-in-law, she, she now is working in like the admin section, but she was working, um, in special education as a teacher. And she would tell me the most difficult stories where she's like, these kids are in special ed, but they're not actually, they don't really have too much wrong with them. Like it's, it's actually a home issue. And so she would talk about how like they're, they're having slower developments because the, you know, grandpa is watching them. Who's like a hundred years old and can't actually take care of a kid. And the parents are, you know, off doing whatever it is that they're doing and they're non-existent in this kid's life. So there really is so many different things that play into these issues that we, or like challenges that we may have when we get older. And I was joking around, like something that popped into my head when you were talking about the book, I wish I had this book, number one, when I was a kid. Um, but I also loved reading it as an adult and often think about it as an adult. And I was thinking about, do you know that, um, Disney Pixar movie soul? Yes. That movie. Mm -hmm. that movie is for adults. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. sobbing like a crazy person talking about living in, I'm literally getting chills thinking about it, but like how to be in the present moment instead of constantly, you know, achieving and whatever. Anyways, the, it's just like, there's so many things that there's so many tools that like this book that can be fantastic for adults. So even if you're listening and you're like, I don't have kids or like whatever, like, honestly, this is an amazing place to start. If you're, you know, feeling into the idea of like, maybe I don't feel my emotions. Cause I can totally relate and agree with what you said of understanding it conceptually, but there's a difference between understanding and then feeling it. 
A hundred percent. Yeah. I, to be honest, sometimes I cry when I read it. Cause I'm like, I didn't let myself feel my emotions today. <laughs> and now I'm reading the book and realizing it. And yeah. I will say like a lot of parents have reached out to me and are like, Oh my God, I need this. I need this book more than my kids do at times. Or like, yeah. I actually had a woman <laughs> reach out to me and say, she's like, my daughter had big emotions when she was little. So I'm sending her this book now. And she's in like, I think she was post-college, like 23 or 24 years old. So um, I think it's, you know, it, why do we go see Disney movies as adults and enjoy them? You know, because it helps us remember the magic inside of ourselves. And I think that's what even having, <laughs> I know, <laughs> doing here today. We're talking about PR, but we're also crying and talking about emotions. Um, but I think it does it like, and, and, you know, this is, this actually, I think kind of leads really nicely into even talking about TV because uh, I remember when I was still working, I was basically working part-time speech therapy and then building my business on the side. I was working like multiple part-time jobs and I went to um, a conference and I remember at the conference, this person said, like, what was your dream as a child? And I was like, I always dreamed of being on TV. Like I always wanted to be on TV. And he was like, own it. Like, if that's what you want, go out and own it. And I remember I just like made this decision and I was like, I want, to, it's, it's not even like, I want to be on TV. Cause I want to be like, everybody look at me. It's just <laughs> yeah. like you said that natural, like I feel most natural in that format. And, um, so I rem like I landed to within a week two TV placements, but it was because I made a decision to do what felt natural for me mm -hmm. and what felt really good for me. And so I found it was a lot easier to do it than I thought it was going to be. Mm. Yeah. This is a huge thing that we also talk about, which is the, the choice that this is for you. Yeah. And I think that that's like, a huge part of the equation too, because we can have the strategy. We can know how to reach out. We can have the coolest story angles, which I'm sure we'll talk about like how you approached, but you made the decision that this is for me. And I think a lot of people are scared to give themselves that permission slip. And we also hope that everyone who listens to this, like just realizes that this is a, an ability and an invitation for you just to claim it and go big and ask yourself what you wanted as a child. And I love that you shared that with us, Jess, because that's a huge piece of PR media coverage speaking in general, it's that invitation to claim that permission slip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Jess, um, I don't know if you, uh, you, yeah, you probably know this. I've talked to you about this. So Bridget comes from the publishing world too. So she knows how it works to like publish your own book. And we were chatting a few days ago and she, I was like, you know what, Jess, like how many books have you sold in like the past, like, you know, month or two or whatever. She like just launched this book and she said, 300 or, or over 300. Like that's amazing. That's insane. <laughs> that's <laughs> insane. And so, and this is self-published. So like, imagine the, and she's just getting started. Like, that's, what's amazing about this. She's truly just getting started. So the impact that she's already created from being on these TV shows, putting herself out there, deciding it's not, you know, out of alignment for me to want to be seen. Like this is literally a part of me. And what I love about your story, Jess, is that you actually had a really successful radio show, which I'd love for you to tell us about. Um, yeah, she she's interviewed people like Jen Gottlieb and like these big names. And so, and she like never talks about, it. I feel like you're the most humble person I know. And so I would love to hear about the radio show and like how that maybe prepared you for getting in front of TV. Cause they're definitely different mediums. Uh, yeah. Which speaking of mediums in general, like we can always create a curated type of PR campaign. So like the fact that you chose TV is great. Like we can go forth with whatever it is that we want. So if we're choosing podcasts, we can do podcasts. If we're choosing editorial, we can do that. And so your medium was TV, but you had started with radio. So yes. Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah. So Honestly, it's funny. I think about it and I'm like, I've done a lot in five. I mean, I started my business. Like I always say, I'm like, I don't even really know when I started it. It was like sometime around like 2015, I started doing yeah. readings for people on the side and then like all the stuff, I, but I went full-time in 2018 for myself and I've done a lot of stuff, but here's the thing, like broadcasting, speaking radio, like voice for me is a 
uh, and, and I'll say like, I've learned it's like voice, but it's also presence. Like it's the, mm-hmm. the energy yeah. of presence that to me has always been, uh, like a calling. It's always just been something that I've known inside of myself that like my method for sharing is my voice. Some people it's art. Some people it's, you know, just simply writing. Everybody has something that's different. And I think a lot to, uh, so basically I started a podcast in like 2017 or 2018. It was called manifest mm-hmm. your best life. And then it took on like many other forms after that. And then, um, I had, yeah, a radio show that I co-hosted with somebody. It was out of Seattle, uh, 1150 KKNW, I think it was. And it was, <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, I heard you guys talking on a, a pod, like a Facebook or IG live the other day, and you were talking about how you, um, like people ask this question of like, okay, I don't have a ton of followers. Like, is Mm -hmm. this like, how do I know if like, if I don't have a lot of followers who would even want to like have me on their show or whatever. And it really was this sort of like being able to offer people this platform to say, Hey, I would love to have you on this radio show. It has a great reach. You know, we're reaching a lot of people. It's a live radio show. It's like, I wanted them to add value to my show. And we had people on who were big names, but we also had people on who just, we really valued what they had to say and what they had to share. And so it also felt good to be able to give a platform to people who maybe didn't have as big of an audience, but had a big message that was important, you know? And I think it's the same thing. Like I've been able to land a lot of, so I, I think I was, what I was saying before around, like I landed two TV shows in a week. It didn't have to do when I decided I wanted to do this. I didn't have a big business. And actually I was on for a charity that I was a part of. Um, Did I, but I didn't have a big following. It's not like I had a following of 30,000 people, 10,000 people. I think at the time, maybe I had an 800 people. This was years ago on Instagram. And it's the same thing now. Like I don't have a huge following. My Jesse Lou books account has like maybe 142 people on it. Um, as does my Jess Bubico. I think I'm only at like 3,500 for my following, um, that I've built over 10 years of doing this. So I think it's important to understand that what you're saying with PR, you know, we've been, social media has only been around for how long, like uh, really 10, 15 years in the way that we use it now. 15, Um, like max, like the way we use it now, I don't know, like five, like I think it was like 2011 when Instagram came out. Cause I remember I was a senior in college or a senior in high school and people were talking about it. And I was like, what? I have like a Blackberry. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So resistant. I was like, I don't even want this. I remember too. Yeah. Yeah. I remember like finally in 2014, I think was like the first time I posted something and I was like, I got four likes and I was like, I'm hot. Like, yeah. get out of here. <laughs> yes. And we've been trained to think that that has significance yeah. or I should say we've been trained to think that social media following has the largest significance when the truth of the matter is that that's just a piece of the puzzle. I at least see social media as a business card where somebody goes, oh, I saw her on that TV show. Let me go check out her social media. Okay, cool. Here's what she's about. She did some interviews. She did this and that. I don't see it as my, um, like a way to validate myself and my worth. It's yeah. more of a place to show myself. And I think anything with media, whether like, again, me having a radio show was, uh, co-hosting a radio show was a way for me to amplify voices as well as share people. Yes. Who were on the more popular side or had a bigger viewing, but that wasn't the whole purpose. And the same thing on the other side, when I pitch myself to a TV show, you know, they don't care if I have a million followers on Instagram, they care that I have a message that's going to help their viewership with back to school anxiety. Yeah. This is something that we've been, we've been having a lot of really good conversations about this with, you know, obviously amongst ourselves, but anyone we've been interviewing and it's like value over follower count. I think we keep saying value, value Trump's follower count every single time. And I love that you're hitting on this. And I'm curious if you can share a little bit of like, what was the angle that you took when you were introducing yourself? Like, how did you talk about yourself? How did you talk about the book? Why did they want to interview you? 
Yeah. So I would say a few things because I'm very big on like following your intuition in anything that you do. So I want to just start out by saying that um, kind of like Lydia, you were saying like you can target your PR t- in a particular direction. Yeah. Like I know like there are people who will like start an Instagram account and have like a million followers in a year. And then there's people that can pitch themselves to podcasts and somehow find themselves on like the largest podcast. And then there's people like myself who was like, I want to be on TV. That feels right. I'm going to go for it. And then it was easy to pick up TV shows. I really think there's a level here of really being able to listen on the inside to what's important to you and know, because I could say to myself, well, I should grow my following. Well, I should go and be on podcasts. Well, I should do kids events in X, Y, and Z place, but that might not actually be the most potent place for me to share my gifts and share my work. So I think first and foremost, it's like, know thyself and know what you want to do and know what excites you because every single person is going to be different. And if I look at Bridget and go, well, Bridget got all these podcasts and she got on the goop podcast, I should be able to do that, but that's not what I want. Then like, does it really matter? And like Lydia's getting herself and featured in all these articles and like all of this, like written press and publicity. Why can't I do it? Well, is that what I want? You know? So I think first and foremost, that feels important to know thyself because then when you know thyself, which is like the basis of my business and using human design and all that stuff, then you're following the path of least resistance versus trying to follow the path of more resistance because your mind's telling you that's what you should do or you're comparing yourself. So that's what I would say first is like understanding self to then be able to take action from that place of groundedness within yourself and knowingness of what you want. And then the second thing I would say is I think my book has been featured in different places for different reasons. And so it Mm -hmm. almost feels like part of this was the ability to find, um, I want to say like pathways of connection to what people were needing. So as an example, if I look at the Jesse Lou book, the first person I pitched, um, oh my gosh, this is so funny. I had a dream about this last night that I'm remembering right now, Lydia, I'll have to remember to tell you about this, but, (laughs) um, Brody, that dude on Instagram, does anybody, if anybody follows Brody, he, him and his dad, Brody, if you're listening, Hey, but him and his dad live in Boca. And he posted that he went on the local news station in West Palm beach and he did a feature. And it seemed like they were into people who are local to the area and wanted to feature them. So I was like, I just, I saw it and I got that hit in my body and I was like, I'm going to just message her and just send a pitch about the book. It was also mental health, uh, awareness month right at the tail end. So I was like, okay, she's into local people and she's it's the end of mental health month. So let me take the angle of, Hey, I'm a local. Hey, I just published a book. Hey, it's mental health awareness month. And I pitched it. The next one, um, was up in Connecticut. I don't live there anymore, but I grew up in Connecticut. I went to school in Connecticut. That was one connection point. The second was she talks about things that are forward thinking. And I know that she's really into, um, it's called Kara's Cures uh, on Great Day, Connecticut. So I knew that she was very into that. So I like, that was, I was like, okay, she's into holistic stuff. I'm going to pitch the book. And I'm also going to take the angle of like, Hey, the connection point is I'm a local Connecticut person grew up here. Um, I'd love to be on the show. And then, um, I just landed another one down in Houston and, um, I took the angle there of like, it's back to school month. So let's ease back to school anxiety. Now I want to say, I have pitched myself to a lot of people. So it's not about just pitching once it's about, I think, spreading that seed of like, I'm going to pitch to a lot of people. I'm going to cast yeah. my net and then let's see what comes back. But I, I do think like finding points of connection, connecting the book to something relevant that's happening right now, um, connecting myself to something personally about the person who's interviewing me can be powerful. Um, and also sometimes I think the third thing is just like following your intuition. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like I just got the ping when I saw Brody, that dude on Instagram. 
Who is this guy? I need to find it's him. It's a dog. It's, a, it's, it's a literally dog. a dog. <laughs> cracking up because she always sends him to me or she did for a while and she's like look how cute I'm like you are the biggest fan to this dog in I Boca. really genuinely am and people are going to be commenting <laughs> under this like I love Brody that dude and also he <laughs> is local I was following him when I lived on the other coast and then I was like he lives in Boca so it's now my dream to run into Brody somewhere in the world I love dogs but I don't want to yeah. get one it's too much responsibility so Anyways, so we can to just give like, him a follow. Yeah, yeah, we can just like bump into him. Yeah. Um, I love how you really honed in on this connection piece because that's something that is really big inside visibility on purpose. We talk about this a lot. It's like, how can you bring the human back into it? Because there is a human on the other end. We're not just like, it's not about us. And I think that that's what one of the biggest pieces is. It's, it's about our message. So it's like, okay, when we take it from that lens, how do we bring the human connection back in? Like you did your research by knowing that like Kara's Cures in Connecticut is a segment that really focuses on that wellness health aspect. So like you did your research, came in with a connection point and that's fantastic. So I think like from a PR perspective, doing a little bit of research. And this stuff is a long-term strategy. Like it's not happening overnight. Like you've been pitching yourself, I know personally, but for a few months now and the book, and it's, it's taking time. So now she's building a momentum of, she got on this show, she got on this show. Now she has this one lined up and you're also utilizing the seasons. So you're very aware, like you mentioned mental health awareness month, like that's freaking genius. You mentioned back to school. So these little tiny tweaks where I like to call them are like, I like to call it the like evergreen pitch. And then we get to like throw in a line. It's like, you need to reinvent the wheel every single time. It's like, we just throw in a line here and there. That's going to help, um, almost like convince, I guess the other person that it makes sense for them at this time, because at the end of the day, they're trying to add value. Like even what you said with your radio show, add value to their show. It's about those value points. It's not about the follower count. It's not about the, this, it's not about the, that it's truly about like, how can I provide value to my listeners and my audience members? How can I generate those clicks? So I really appreciate you saying all this. And like, I do want to pivot to the book if that's okay, because yeah. I freaking cried <laughs> as we know over this book, like, um, do you want to just, I mean, like I was going through the pages and I'm like, do I do like an excerpt here? But I'd love to just hear like maybe a little excerpt or we can even just talk about big emotions and like the journey throughout the book of what you're trying to, yeah, help the, the child and the parent uh, accomplish while reading this. Yeah, absolutely. So Basically, really I'm going to give you a little overview of like what the book is about and kind of Perfect. like a synopsis, and then I'll start to dive into that. So basically the book, obviously my name is Jess. The character's <laughs> name is Jesse Lou. My dad called me Jesse Lou when I was a kid. Um, and in the book, there is basically it starts out with Jesse Lou. She's out playing with her friends. And, um, I want to just shout out to, before I start that my, uh, illustrator's name is Danny Summerfield and she did an amazing job with the images. They're colorful, they're bright, they're fun. Like they're really beautiful. Um, oh, that's my favorite page. So I love that. Yeah. So she just, she did such a good job. She's based out of the UK. Um, and she was like the perfect fit of the person to illustrate this book. So basically the book starts out and Jesse Lou is out playing with her friends. And um, she kind of has this like inner secret that she has big emotions. And even though she's out here kind of on this first page, you'll see, let me show, like she's out there playing with her friends and you can kind of see her having a good time. And then on the next page, it start, sort of talks about like, she also felt, she felt happy, but she felt different on the inside. And you see, she's kind of like sensitive and nervous in her heart and mind. And so it kind of like reveals that like, even though, which I think a lot of people can relate to, even though she's happy and she's joyful, she has these fears and she has these worries and she has these big emotions. And so in the book, she goes into her room and she like cries because she's feeling sad. She's having a hard day. 
And this guardian angel appears in her room and basically teaches her that number one, it's normal to have big emotions. It's okay to feel them. Number two, it's important not to keep them jarred. And that by using our, um, like using movement and breath, we can actually, number one, acknowledge the emotion. Number two, we can move the emotion. And number three, we can use the breath, the breath to ground back into ourselves. And so um, through the book, you'll see like, she's got just like, there's these beautiful images of like Jesse Lou and her I love dog this page. Gus and like <laughs> Nellie and Nellie is actually my grandma's name. Um, just going through this process. And so for, because of my speech therapy background, I, um, knew that it's important to give parents and teachers and kids like a very practical, tangible way to approach doing this process, right? We can know it, we can talk about it, but it's important to give an actual process to parents and kids and teachers to like go like, okay, what do I do now? How do I do this? How do I acknowledge emotions? So the back part of the book um, offers like a really simple five-step process just to go through and start to work through big emotions. So you see, it's like, you can work with your kid and go, okay, step one, step two, we put an emotion chart, the Gus emotion chart in there as well. (laughs) Um, Who is the dog? As you can see, As I was talking about Brody, that dude, love dogs, Uh, (laughs) but Gus is the little dog who's kind of her companion throughout the book. So, um, yeah, I mean, I honestly, I was sharing like the week that I published the book, I went to an event and it was with a lot of people I hadn't seen in a while. And I was like super anxious because I'm like, oh my God, who I was back in high school when these people knew me as like not who I am now. And then, you know, the memories and then shame started to come up. And I was like, okay, I just wrote a book on this. And I just like went in the bathroom and I was like, I'm going to do my little Jesse Lou thing. Number one, acknowledge that I'm feeling anxious. Number two, move my body a little bit. And number three, just like put my hand in my heart and remind myself it's okay. So I think it's, again, it's while it's written for kids, I think it's for people of all ages. You know, as you said that, you also reminded me, reminded me of something because as you are on TV and as you publish a book, that's kind of like you showing yourself to the world. Like it's a very vulnerable state and it's, you know, interesting that you had this reunion of sorts and you had to then show up as this person, like what kind of piece of advice would you give someone who's nervous to be seen because they're still attached to the old identity of self from, you know, high school, college, maybe early on in their career. I think a lot of people struggle with this. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so here's what I'll say. I think number one, showing up and being seen in a certain way and being vulnerable. Like we don't have to let it all out and be like, I was this way when I was younger and I made these mistakes, but to be able to say like, I, you know, I'm a human and this is the human journey. I think what we do is we model for other people, the fact that we're human and it's okay to be human and it's okay to make mistakes. So I actually think becoming more visible, showing yourself Um, being seen is actually an opportunity to be in acknowledgement of the fact that we grow and change throughout our lifetimes. Oh, it's like a healing. Yes. Seriously chills. I also love that something we talk about a lot is weaving our own stories in to pitches and into our work. And you so beautifully described like how your own personal life has prompted this book all of us, whether we want to admit it or not, uh, all of our businesses, especially I see service-based because a lot of it comes from the heart is like, we went through something in our life that has prompted the reason why we're doing this today. And I think that again, bringing it back to that human connection and that connection point, like people are people and they want to feel like they can relate to things. And so by you being vulnerable and just saying like, yeah, like I, my dad called me Jesse Lou. And like this story is my grandma's in it. I am basically in it. Gus, the dog, like all these different pieces coming into this like amazing project. I find even more inspiring because it's like, it is inspiring others that they can add their heart into what they're doing. And then they can amplify it on big stages. 
A hundred percent. And I will say, um, it's been so fun. It like makes me teary eyed because I've gotten so many people with like sending pictures of their kids and somebody sent me one the other day, a lot of parents too. And like, kids are so intuitive. Like a lot of kids are just like getting it. And a parent Mm -hmm. sent me a message the other day that said that her daughter said that, uh, she called the, the angel, the guardian of emotions that her guardian of emotions had would have rainbow hair. And she said, she actually asked, she said, cause, um, in the book, Nellie turns into a ladybug, which is representative of my grandpa. Like I just, when he passed away, I was like, every time I see a ladybug, that's going to be my grandpa. So you'll see in the page like the little ladybug on the nose (laughs) and you'd be surprised like my friend whose child is I think he's like 18 months became like obsessed with the ladybug in the book um and she said to her mom so every time we see a ladybug now is that a sign that a protector is near us I was like oh how cute and you'll see too like if you purchase the book like I put a picture of myself in these red cowboy boots um as a kid which was the inspiration for the red boots in the book and I think people like having points of connection. They like to see, they want to know you through your art, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, it's, I love it. I love this book. I can't wait to write more of them there. There's another one that I already wrote, which is Jesse Lou goes to the zoo, but we're going to give it a little bit of time before I put it out there. <laughs> also, um, my sister is like a little redheaded girl. So I put her on the book as well. There's a little redheaded girl in there. Um, I asked her, I was like, do you want to be in the book? She was like, sure. So um, we can weave so much meaning. And I think that it also inspires other people to see that they can do anything as well. If it's something that it's in, that's inside of their heart. Yeah. I love this. I'm going to pivot us for a moment because I am very curious. And I think this could help people listening. Number one, what is your human design? And number two, how do the design types impact the way that we might approach the media or share about artwork? Absolutely. Okay. So now I'm going to switch over into my other brain, which deals with all of this mechanical stuff, which I absolutely love. Um, And I intend to write books for parents and kids on this as well, because I think it's really helpful to understand mechanically. So in, um, I am a four, six emotional manifester. So in human design, we have five archetypes. We've got the manifester, the manifesting generator, the generator, the projector, and the reflector. And so each one kind of shows up a little bit differently in the world and how they, um, share their message with the world, if you will. And a good friend of mine, Amanda Foley is doing a lot with helping people to understand that, like from the perspective of media and PR and things like that. So she's really amazing. Um, but I can kind of give just an overview. Each type is, we have something called a strategy in human design. And so our strategy is going to inform how we interact with the world around us. So manifestors, which is myself and Lydia are designed to initiate. And so when I think about this from the perspective of like how these things have come through for me, like I just kind of had that hit where I was like, I've got this urge, I've got a message to this woman and I'm going to share the book. So manifestors are really designed to kind of like follow their urges and where they take them. Um, like I'll just, it, and that urge too can be like one day I'm like, I just need to sit down and pitch today. And it's funny. Cause when I pitched to the station in Houston that I just found, I, um, I couldn't find this other list I had, which was what I wanted to pitch first, but I was like, I'm having the urge. I've got a pitch. Let me put it out there. And then it, you know, everything started to go from there. So manifestors kind of follow their urge and put themselves out there. Generators, um, are designed to respond. So I always say like things like even looking at, um, like Amanda is really amazing. She'll like listen to podcasts and she'll find a point of connection through listening to a bunch of podcasts and being like, that's a great angle. I'm going to reach out to that person. And she'll follow that sort of like feeling she gets in response to something that she's seeing. Um, or she'll like Haro, Harrow, I don't know how you say it, but like help a reporter out. She'll like find angles or she'll listen to what's going on in the news right now. So she's really great with immersing herself as a generator into work podcasts, media, and then listening to her body when it goes respond to that and pitch an angle in that direction. Um, 
projectors are really here to kind of like be seen and be seen doing what they do best and see where they get recognized. So I think for projectors, really being able to highlight your work and show yourself in a way where you're very like visible and you're sharing what you've done and people can kind of see you, I think is really important. Um, as it relates to manifesting generators, they're kind of a hybrid of the manifester and the generator. So both like just, you know, reaching out, following their urges, following where they feel called to go and share themselves and then responding to what's showing up in, you know, the media around them is really important. Um, reflectors, you know, they're a really interesting type because reflectors are really here to kind of like respond, uh, or to reflect back to us how we're doing. And so I think being able to like for a reflector to really say like, okay, what is going on in the media and how can I show up as the, or what's going on currently in this timeline? How can I show up and present myself in a way where I'm really representing this solution for the whole of like what's going on in the here and now, I think can be really powerful because reflectors have this ability to, again, kind of show us how we're doing and reflect back to us how we're doing. So I think really focusing on those like current topics of what's going on right now and high, it's almost like, again, what's the approach? We're all pitching ourselves, but like kind of how, what's the angle that we take? I think reflectors really like owning that, like, I see how we can move forward in the world um, could be a really beautiful way to start reaching out. This is so good. You know, I'm, as you're speaking, it's like, I'm thinking about my one reflector friend and I'm like, this is so him. It's crazy. Yeah. And that's really, yeah. Yeah. So I wonder like, um, anyways, pivoting back to all the different types, are there any specific blocks maybe? So we get this, we get this question a lot actually. And we had a round of visibility on purpose where there was quite a few human, human design people in them. And they were having a hard time understanding like their place in pitching. So mm -hmm. I would love to hear, cause this is my personal pers personal perspective on this, which may be wrong. And I would love to hear your thoughts, but my personal perspective is like, okay, I'm a manifester. I'm not supposed to be like probably doing the grunt work of pitching all day, but I also know that I have a goal in mind. And so how can I keep my energy at a certain level so that I can still achieve that goal? And so I think sometimes I've heard of human design experts or maybe individuals just like getting a little stuck in a box of like, this is how I'm supposed to be. So I can't do that. Or I can't approach the media in this way. I think any time that we take human design and we make it a right versus wrong thing, I think that's where we start to lose the point with human design. Mm. And I think anything that is mental and comes from the mind and we start putting ourselves into boxes is where we start to challenge ourselves. And so the point of human design, and if you listen back to like what the creator of human design said, he was like, listen to everything I say. And also don't listen to anything that I say, because the idea is that human design is designed to be an experiment. And the purpose of human design, the way I see it is all it's meant to do when we look at type strategy and authority and other people might argue with this and that's fine is it is meant to take us back to our bodies and learning to listen to our bodies. Mm, I, I know you very well. I know my friend, Amanda, very well. And Amanda, I will say is much better at talking about like the practicality of using this in the PR world than I am. Um, I kind of take a different angle, a little bit of a different angle. She and I collaborate together, but I watch the two of you take very different approaches to PR and the way that you pitch it. it Technically we could say, well, like I shouldn't be doing that because I'm a manifester, but that's not true. Like, you know, if you look at, I don't know, brushing your teeth, like you wake up in the morning and you have to initiate brushing your teeth. Like you're yeah. not brushing your teeth in response to anything <laughs> or going like, until I smell that I have bad breath, I'm going to then brush my teeth or that I see I have broccoli <laughs> in my teeth. No, you have to brush your teeth. Okay. Same thing with PR. Like if you want to get yourself out there in a bigger way, you have to do it. But here's the difference. Like I see you really following your urges. You're like, I don't know. I just feel like reaching out and I got to initiate it in this way. Whereas I see that Amanda has more traction when she really immerses herself as a generator and like listens to her body. So I think 
we don't change the title of the thing. We don't change the title of the task, which is PR. We have to brush our teeth. I'm not going to not put on clothes because nobody, (laughs) there's nothing to respond to. No, I'm going to put on clothes because I have to. So I'm going to do PR because I want to become visible and seen in a bigger way. And I'm going to use the way that feels most natural for me to do it. So I think if I was to say to somebody in your class, like, what quote should you do? It would be what feels like them, even if you don't know your human design, you know, how many people don't know their human design and still function and are very, very <laughs> um, productive in this world and successful. It's what does your body say in response? Does it feel weird to cold pitch and reach out? Do you see Brody, that dude on Instagram on that thing? And you don't feel the urge to reach out, but you feel like you need another pathway in. Okay. Well, what feels right for your body? And when you follow that and you trust that you get the next breadcrumb and the next breadcrumb and the next breadcrumb, my way of doing it is just, I get the urge and I know I have to do it. I wake up and I'm like, I got to pitch all of these people today. Cool. What is it for you? I'm going to listen to all these articles or I'm going to watch all these YouTube videos. Now I know what to do. Yeah. Cause it gives me something because everything at the end of the day, any of the, any of these authorities are just kind of, they're not telling us what to do or not to do. They're just kind of telling us again, the way that's most natural for us to do it based on our body. So if you know, you hear one way, go try out different ways and see what works for you. It's, it's meant to be an experiment. Yeah. Thank you so much for going into that. That was the most beautiful response (laughs) at which we're going to use and we shall quote you. Um, I so appreciate it because it is all about listening to, at the end of the day, everything is all about listening to our inner guidance and what we need. And I love your perspective on working with your intuition, working with your design and all of this to make our dreams a reality. That's like, I feel like really been the bulk of this conversation. So just thank you. Thank you for the value and the freaking funny laughs. I tried so hard not to like be like crack up for, for audio reasons. But like, I also want you guys to know I'm laughing because Jess is freaking funny anyways. Okay. Yeah. So where can we find, (laughs) where can we find the book? Where can we find more information about you, different offers um, and things that you're doing right now? Because I know our audience is going to want to really dive into your work. Thank you. Yeah. So first off, you can go over to Amazon and find Jesse Lou and the magic of you. Um, And I would say just for fun, if you know of somebody who has big emotions and you want to send the book to them, if you um, know of a teacher that this would be a great asset in their classroom during uh, for back to school, anything like that, please feel free to pass it along. My hope is to really, um, you know, through the book is more so like the bigger picture is just teaching people to love and accept themselves as they are. Um, and also to recognize that emotions pass, you know, we aren't, we aren't, um, I can't think of the right word right now. Like we're not, uh, damned by our emotions. Like they are a passing state of being and they are a natural, they are natural. So anybody who needs that message, feel free to pass it along. And then you can find me over on Instagram, um, at Jesse Lou books. It's just J E S S I L O U books. Um, that's where the book will be. I'm doing a whole back to school series next week. I'm teaming up with a bunch of people to talk about back to school and helping our kids regulate their nervous systems for back to school, et cetera. So I'll be doing IG lives all next week. And then you can find me at Jess Bubico um, over on Instagram as well. Um, I've got a class going that's messaging by design with my friend Amanda, where we're really going to dive deep into your message using your design and speaking the words of your design and your gene keys. So you can go and check me out at Jess Bubico or JessBubico.com. Thanks, Thanks. Jess. Thank you, Jess. Thank you Thank so much you. for joining us on Visibility Era.